Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Oak. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing the first two out of five rounds today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a variety of exclusive perks, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. There you can support the channel and see things like my opinions episodes where I talk about all of the games that I'm filming lately. You'll also watch many of my videos early and advertise free, and you can even vote on one of the videos that's made each month. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask is if while you are watching this video, any part of the game really jumps out to you, or if you see a turn where we really should have done something differently, then please comment about it down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, this is set in a hidden forest, and each of the players is in control of a different druidic order. In the center of the forest lies the massive sacred oak, and as we're playing through the game, each of us is going to use the druids within our order in order to increase our devotions and ultimately try to get the most victory points to prove that their order is the most worthy. Now, mechanically, the way this game works is we are going to go through five full rounds, and within each of those rounds, we are going to be sending our druids out to do a variety of things. Our active druids can go to various temple sites, and the specific things we can do there are dictated on these moot cards. We can also send druids to special sites in order to activate specific actions, and every single druidic order has unique actions printed on them. Now, each player also has passive druids that are underneath the sacred oak. These druids can actually climb into the tree, which will gain access to victory points as well as ongoing income when various solstice festivals are triggered. Players can also use their passive druids to harvest various important ingredients that can later be used to brew potions that give powerful effects. Now, in addition to all this, players can fashion various artifacts, which will provide new action spots with powerful options on them, and players can also befriend various creatures, which give a wide variety of beneficial effects. Next up, let's focus down here, because as you can see, each one of these druids can be upgraded into an elder druid by placing one of these tokens down on top of it. It will stay there for the rest of the game, and elder druids can unlock specific action spots on the board, and each elder druid provides a different benefit when used to do various actions. As you can see, there are a bunch of tokens that can be used to create these elder druids, and choosing which elder druid to upgrade into is a big part of this game. Now, there is certainly more going on, but I think at this point I'm going to stop the overview, and don't worry, I'll explain how all of this works as we bump into them while playing the game. On that note, let's now start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to play as the Orange Druid. Well, let's focus in the top left corner of the board, because as you can see, this is a round tracker. This shows that there will be five rounds to the game before we go into final scoring, and we are now starting the first round of the game. Each round is split into three phases. The first is dawn, the second is day, and the third is dusk. For the first round of the game, we actually skip the dawn phase entirely, so I'll talk more about that when we get into the second round, and now we can move into the day phase. The way this works is the player with the starting player token is going to begin, and that is us. So let's now take our turn. Let's focus over here on our player board. Now at the start of the game, we have three active druids that are here on these resting spaces, and we also have six passive druids that are underneath the sacred oak. Now on each player's turn during the day phase, we have to do one thing, and there are three different options available to us. The first is we can take any one of our active druids and send them to an applicable action space. Each player board has some action spaces printed on them. Those with this silver border can have any druid go there, and those with this golden border must have an elder druid, which means they've been upgraded by a token, and those can be placed over here. Now, action spots like these can also show up in other places on the game, and that's just one of the options available to us. The next option is we can take one of our moot cards and place it face up in front of us. We each start with these three moot cards, and each of them have a variety of options on them. The third thing that we could do is pass, and then use our passive druids to gather ingredients, but I don't think we're going to be passing on this turn. I think what we will be doing, however, is playing a moot card. So let's play this one here, and as you can see, each of these moot cards is associated with one of the three temples that are out there on the board. There's the Rune Temple, the Feather Temple, and the Mistletoe Temple, and the Mistletoe card is the one we want to play. 
So let's focus in on the card. Now, as you can see, there are three lines up here, and then down below, there is another line, and these are essentially options available to us. If we choose one of these three, then we are going to send an active druid from a resting space, and that'll go onto the associated part of the temple. If we choose the bottom one, then we'll actually send a passive druid up the oak tree, and we're not doing that right now, so I'll explain how that works later on. Now, in this case, I think what we want to do is perform this third line option. That means we have to take an active druid, which means they're on a resting spot. And in this case, we are going to send them to the three stone spot in the mistletoe temple. When we focus out on the main board, you can see the three temples are right out here. And within each temple, there are three different locations, a single stone spot, a double stone spot, and a triple stone spot. As I mentioned, we want to send an active druid to the triple stone spot in the mistletoe temple. So that's right over here. So we can place that active druid down onto the board. And remember, it was active because we removed it from a resting spot in our player area. After arriving there, it's now time for us to pay the indicated cost. If we look at this card, specifically for the three stone spot, it's going to cost us six mistletoe to perform this action. So let's once again focus on our board. As you can see, we have three different tracks, and these show us how much of the three resources we have. We start the game with six of each, and as I just said, this action is going to cost six mistletoe, so we can show that by moving this marker all the way down to the zero. After that, we can perform the indicated action for the line that we chose. In this case, that says we can upgrade any regular druid into an elder. So let's focus over here, and as you can see, there are six different tokens, and those are associated with the six different types of elders. Now, we're not actually allowed to create an Elder of the Ancients just yet. That can only happen by brewing this specific potion, and I'll explain how that works later on in the tutorial. So we have to choose one of these five options, and every single one of them will turn that druid into an Elder Druid, but each of these also has a different benefit. Our player aid describes all of these benefits, and I'll go through all of these by the time the tutorial is over, but for now I think let's take the cape and create a reclusive elder druid. Now we can place this down onto any druid of our choice, and we'll go with this one, and we'll just slide that right on top. As you can see, that's a nice cape for the druid, and this is now an elder recluse style druid for the rest of the game. Now I'll explain the specific benefit for them being reclusive later on, and for now we can leave them on our resting space. All right, that's finished our one action, so that means our turn is done, and play now moves in clockwise order to the yellow player. For their turn, they are also going to play a moot card, and in this case, they've chosen the Feather Temple card. Now, they want to send an active druid out to one spot, and specifically, they are going to go to the three stone spot. Now, that is going to cost them six feathers, and they start the game with six, so that means they can go down to zero, and then the effect of this says they can gain one artifact. So, as I said, they'll place this active druid onto the three stone spot in the Feather Temple, and then when they take an artifact, they can choose any one of these three that are face up. So, let's focus in, and I do want to mention that before they take one of these, they could optionally once spend a Ruin resource in order to put all three of these to the bottom of the deck, and then reveal three more. Now, they're not going to do that because they actually really like the idea of this artifact right here, so they are going to take that, and as soon as they do, a new one is immediately revealed from the top of the deck. Next up, they can place this artifact next to their board, and as you can see, they have two spots that can hold artifacts. Now, if you have artifacts in both of these already, then you cannot take a new artifact until you have cleared one of these off, and I'll explain how you clear these off later on. Now, as soon as you put this down, you will gain the indicated number of points, and you make sure to align this with the top option here. In this case, that is four points, so the yellow player gains four points, which brings them to four. Well, let's finish Yellow's turn, and don't worry, I'll explain more about how to use these artifacts rather soon. This means play goes clockwise over to the Teal player, and for their turn, they also want to play a Feather Temple moot card. Now, they could actually choose this action if they wanted to. Remember, that is the spot that the Yellow player went to. And what happens when you send an active druid to a specific location where there is at least one other active druid is you have to also take another active druid and make them passive by sending them underneath the sacred oak. So that means they would effectively use two of their druids to do that. And this will stay a passive druid until a future time when they potentially recruit it back. So by doing that, they have effectively lowered the number of active druids they have by one, and they've decided that's not going to be worth it to them. This means they are not going to choose the three stone option for the Feather Temple, and instead they'll go with the two stone option. Now this is also going to cost them six of their feathers, so they'll lose all six that they started the game with, and then they can send this active druid to the two stone spot in the Feather Temple. After that they will gain the benefit, which allows them to take one creature card. 
So the druid will go here in that two stone location. And then when they go to take a creature card, they can select any of these three face up. Or before they do that, they could spend one mistletoe to put all three of these to the bottom of the deck and then reveal three more. Now they don't want to do that. They actually really like the idea of this creature right here. So they are going to take that and then immediately a new creature is going to be drawn from the top of the deck. So this is the creature they took and now they have to place it underneath their board. As you can see, there are spaces for creatures all the way along the bottom, and there are also spaces along the top, and those are locations for shrines and menhirs, and I'll explain how those work soon. Now, when they put this creature down, they have to put it into the far leftmost open spot, and you can tell if a spot is open or not by looking at this limiter token. Now, this starts the game right here, and everything to the left of that token is open. That means right now, at the start of the game, we only have one spot for creatures. So the teal player could not put a second creature over here because that would be to the right of the blocking token. Fortunately, as a free action, players can always spend the indicated resources in order to slide this over, and this can vary from one druidic order to the next. In this case, it looks like the teal player can spend three runes to move that over once. Fortunately, they don't have to do that right now because they did start the game with one empty spot. Now, as soon as they take this creature, they'll gain the points indicated at the top. In this case, that says three points, and then they will gain a specific benefit. Now, these benefits can vary wildly with the creatures, and this one in particular says for the rest of the game, whenever the teal player visits a temple, they pay one less resource for doing so. Well, teal does get three points for that creature, so they can take those. And now their turn is done, which means it's once again time for us to go. So let's focus over here, and currently we have two active druids, and this one happens to be an elder druid. Now I think for our turn, instead of playing one of our two remaining moot cards, let's actually send this elder druid over here. Now these are action spaces, as I mentioned before, and when there is a gold border, that means an elder druid must go there. Now elder druids can go to standard action spots as well, but in this case we want to go here. Now these are the specific special actions that we have as this order of druids. All of the other player boards have different effects over here. For us, we happen to be pretty good at gaining ingredients and brewing potions, more so than our opponents anyway, and I wanted to lean into that. So let's focus in, and of course again we are able to do this because we have an Elder Druid. Now this effect says we can take three random ingredients out of the crane bag. The crane bag is right over here, so we can simply take three random ingredients and then hopefully use these for brewing potions later on. In this case, it looks like we found bark, berries, as well as some more bark. Well, that's finished a pretty quick turn for us, so now the yellow player can go. And they have decided to also not spend a moot card. Instead, they're going to send this active druid to an action space. Now, they have one printed on their board, but you'll notice it has a golden border, which means an elder druid must go there. But they have a new action space over here on their artifact. Every artifact has a standard action spot, so they can place their active druid there, and then they have to rotate this and also lose any points that are indicated. In this game, white means gaining things and red means spending them. So they actually have to spend one point, and remember they got four points for taking this, so they're effectively eating into the points that this artifact already gave them. So they'll go from four back to three and then they can perform the effect printed on this artifact. Now, as you can see, there are multiple steps here, and in the future, once this clears at the end of the round, they could go here again to spin this again. They'll lose two points, but then get to do this. The next time, they'll lose three points. They'll do this, and then this will flip over, and that will free up the spot for a new artifact, and they'll keep this in front of them, because it's possible they could score extra points for it in other ways. Of course, that's not the case right now. It's right over here, and the effect for this artifact says they can take one creature card. So once again, they could take any of these or spend a mistletoe to see three more, and they really like the idea of this creature card here. Now that is going to get them three victory points immediately, which will take them up to six, and then they can take this creature and place it into their open spot over here. You'll notice they also had one open location at the beginning of the game, and in order to move this over for them, they just have to spend three resources of any type, not one specific type, and that's just one of the effects of this specific druidic order. Now, the effect of this card says for the rest of the game, the yellow player can send any druid to a special action spot. Remember, normally these require elder druids, but now they can send any of them, and this is huge for them, considering they have one of those on their board. So that means using this effect, they could send this druid to that action spot, and it's possible that's what they're going to do with their next turn, but we'll just have to see when the time comes. All right, yellow is done, so that means the teal player can go again, and they've decided to play another moot card. This is going to be for the rune temple, and they are going to select the top option. 
Now, that would normally cost them three runes, but remember, they have a creature that lowers their resource cost by one, so they'll spend just two runes for this. That means they go from six down to four, and then they do have to send an active druid to the one stone location at the rune temple. As you can see, that's right over here, and I do want to point out that in a three-player game, there is one neutral druid out here. It is going to move to a different temple at the end of each round, and that means if any of us wanted to go onto this spot, we would obviously have to pay an extra druid back to the bottom of the oak tree, turning it passive, because remember, if there's at least one druid of any color on that spot, you have to pay that penalty. In this case, they're going to the single stone spot, not the two stone spot, so it looks like they're fine. After that, they can gain the indicated effect, and in this case, that says they can recruit two passive druids. So they can take up to two of them from the shade of the sacred oak and place them onto resting spaces on their board, and they happen to have two resting spaces right over here. That's finished their turn, and obviously that's pretty powerful. They're back up to having three active druids in front of them that they can use. Well, they're done, which means we can now take our turn. And I think instead of playing a moot card, let's perform another action, specifically this one over here printed on our board. Now that can have any druid go to it, and this lets us brew one potion. Brewing potions is going to cost ingredients, and remember we picked these up on our last turn. Now we can focus over here on the board, because we have to select one of these four different potion options to brew. Now every time we play the game, this is always going to be out there, but then we always put a level 1 potion here, two there and three there and these are going to stay there for the rest of the game but of course each time you play you'll have a different randomized token here so you'll always see different combinations of potion effects that are available now in order to brew a potion you have to spend the indicated ingredients on it for this one on the board you have to spend three four or five different ingredient types and then you'll gain three five or seven points respectively when it comes to the others this one requires one bark and then one ingredient of any type this one requires an acorn and a root and this one requires an acorn and two mushrooms now we pulled up one berry and two bark which means realistically this is the only potion we can afford we only have two types so we cannot even get up to the three types to perform this one here now that's still fine let's go ahead and spend one bark as well as one berry these will go back into the bag, and then we can take this benefit. Now, this says we can move two of our blocking tokens once to the right. I mentioned before that as a free action, you can spend the indicated resources to move these, but this is a more efficient way to actually move these over. So far, we don't really need to do this. We haven't put anything down over here, and I think because of that, we'll just move each of these once to leave ourselves nice and flexible for the top and bottom options. The next thing that happens is we can take a completed potion token. We'll just keep this in front of us, and this shows that we've completed one potion, and that's because there are ways to gain extra points based off of the number of potions you've completed. Well, that's finished our turn, which means it's now time for the yellow player to go, and they are going to send their regular druid to this special action spot. Remember, normally you would need an elder druid there, but they have a creature that breaks that rule for them, and then the effect for them is quite simple. They could take six runes, six mistletoe, or six feathers. Now, each of these tracks can only hold up to nine of these types, so they are simply going to take six feathers because it would be a waste for them to take either of the other options. Well, yellow is done, so that means teal can go again. After considering their options, they're going to play their third moot card, and they're going to head to the Mistletoe Temple. Now, the option they're going to go for is this one. That's the two-stone option, and it'll cost them five Mistletoe. So that would normally bring them down to one, but remember they have a one resource discount, so they'll only spend four mistletoe for this, so that goes down to two. Now they can send this active druid to the two stone location in the mistletoe temple, and the effect they gain is building one shrine. The mistletoe temple is here, and that is the two stone option, and when they create a shrine, they simply take one of these cards. Every one of these has a menher on one side and a shrine on the other, so they can flip it over to the shrine side and then they can tuck this under an open spot at the top of their board. Currently, they have one open spot right here, and as you can see, there's two options. This first option gets them two points, and the other option gives them four, and each of these gives them a new resting location. Now, the difference between these is this one can only hold regular druids, whereas the other one can take a regular druid or an elder druid. Now, as you can see, you make two less points if you want this to be an Elder Druid spot, and the deal player decides to go with this one. The reason for that is because part of their specific asymmetric benefit is every one of their resting spots can hold an Elder, whereas the rest of our boards can only hold one. You can see that by focusing back on our board, where you can see two of the regular Druid locations, and then there's one with that Elder Druid symbol. 
So they figure they have more than enough space to hold Elder Druids, of which they currently don't have any. Their special action over here lets them create Elder Druids, and I'm sure we'll see them do that soon. So they're going to tuck this like that and gain four points, and they've also gained a new resting spot for their increased active Druid pool. So they'll gain four points, which brings them up to ten. And now their turn is done. This means it's time for us to go, and we don't have any active druids anymore, but that does not mean we don't have options for our turn. As I mentioned before, we could either send an active druid to an action spot, we could also play a moot card to go to a temple, we could also play a moot card to go up the oak tree, and we could pass. Now, I don't think we're going to pass in this moment. Instead, let's go ahead and play this feather moot card and then perform the bottom option. Now that is going to cost us three feathers, which brings us down to three, and then we can progress one passive druid up the oak. So let's focus out here on the tree. Now we have six passive druids at the bottom of the tree, and one of them can climb up the tree, and specifically they're going to head towards the feather branch. Now this tree has three main branches, and then there are other branch options as you continue to go up. So let's focus in, and we will place this passive druid on the first spot of the associated branch. Remember, we played the Feather Moot card, and that will move us up the Feather Branch over here. Now, that is immediately going to get us two points, and it will possibly gain us feathers when the Solstice Festivals happen, and I'll explain how those work later on. So, we can gain two points, and those are the first points we've gained this game so far, and I do want to point out that whenever you go up the Oak Tree, if you already have a Druid on that specific branch, you simply move them up the branch, you don't add a new one onto the tree. That means each player can have a maximum of three Druids on the tree at any point in the game. This also means that once you reach a branch off point, you'll have to choose which of the branches to go down, because you will not be able to go down the other one. Well, at this point, we are done with our turn, so now the yellow player can go, and they are also going to play a moot card to do an oak tree action. After considering it, they're going to go with the mistletoe option, so they have to spend three mistletoe to do that, which will bring them down to three, and then they'll send a passive druid up to the mistletoe branch, and that is also going to get them two points. Yellow is done, so teal can go again and they have decided to activate this action spot. Now that effect lets them turn any of their druids into an elder druid, and it looks like they've also decided to go with the cape to create a reclusive druid, and again, I'll explain how that works along with all of the elder druid options later on. Well, teal is done, which means we can go again, and we could pass, but I think we're actually going to hold off on that and instead play our final moot card. This one says we can spend three runes to advance once on that limb of the tree. So we'll go down to three runes total, and then we don't have a druid in the rune branch, so a new passive one's going to climb up the tree, and that is going to gain us two victory points. We are done, so yellow can go, and they could also do this if they want to. And considering they have so many resources, they're going to go for it. They are going to spend three runes, which brings them down to three, and then they can send a passive druid up to that same spot, and there is no benefit or penalty for sharing a spot with a druid. So that is going to get the yellow player two more points. And now it's time for the teal player to go. Now for their options, they have no more moot cards, so they can't play any of those. And when it comes to action spots, they don't have any on their board, but there is one on the main board as you can see right up here in the top right corner. Now there's one of these spots for every single player, so in each round, every player can activate one of these. It requires an Elder Druid to go there, and when you do, you then have to spend three feathers, three mistletoe, and three runes, but then you can build a Menher. As you can see, this just gives you six points, but six points is quite a lot. Now at this moment, the teal player does not have room at the top of their board for one of these. And they also don't have the resources to pay for this. Uh, of course, they'd have to pay extra resources to move their locking token. So unfortunately, this is not an option for them right now. So instead, they're going to pass. Now that's the case, even though they have an active druid, they just don't have a good spot to use them. They're fine with that, though. They've built up a situation to have a lot of them in the next round, and they feel like that'll be a good thing for them then. Now, once a player passes, they're going to take a passive druid from under the oak, and they're going to send it over here in order to gather ingredients. At the start of each round, we're going to put a number of ingredients over here equal to the player count plus two, and now this passive druid can collect one of these ingredients. In this case, they've decided to take this mushroom, and that's their entire turn. Now, once you pass once in the round, you'll have to pass on every subsequent action for the rest of that day phase. Each time you pass, you take a new passive druid from under the tree, go over here and take an ingredient if possible. If you don't have any more passive druids, or if there are no more ingredients over here, then in that case, you just pass and don't actually do anything else. 
Well, Teal is done, so now we get to go, and we are also going to pass. We don't have any more moot cards to play, and we don't have any active druids either. So we can move a passive druid over here, and then... Hmm. I feel like we should take this root or this acorn, and, you know, let's go for the root. After that, yellow can go, and they are also going to pass. And they've decided to take an acorn. After this, it's time for Teal to go again. Now, at this point, you'll notice that everyone has passed, but we only finish the day phase once everyone has passed, and there are no more ingredients over here. Everyone has passed, but there are still ingredients, so we will keep on going, and that means the Teal player can send a passive druid over here, and they are going to take this acorn. After that, we can pass, and we certainly will. We'll go over here and take this berry. And now the day phase ends immediately. Now remember, that's going to happen once everyone has passed, and once all of these ingredients are gone, although it's also possible to have it end once everyone has passed, and there are no more druids under the tree to pick up ingredients that are still over here. In this circumstance, there are no ingredients, and everyone has passed, so that means the day phase is over. This means we can now perform the dusk phase of the first round, and the first thing that we need to do is take all of our druids that are on temples or action spots or on items and place them back onto resting locations. Now, if you don't have enough resting locations for those druids, then all of the extras go back over here underneath the oak tree. So for us, we can take this druid here, and then we can place these over there, and now we can talk about the special effect of the Recluse. You may have noticed this spot over here on the board, and that is specific to the Recluse. Now, I took this because I was hoping we'd also potentially be able to increase the number of active druids that we had to make use of that, but it looks like that wasn't the case, so I probably should have created a different type of Elder Druid, but either way, that's fine. We'll have this for the rest of the game, and I'm sure at some point we'll be happy to have that spot open for us. The teal player can also do this, and they also have a recluse, so they can put the recluse over there and then take all of these druids back. And as you can see, because they created this shrine up there, they now have spots for all of their active druids. Lastly, yellow will do this as well. They can remove this one from their artifact and this one from their board. The next thing that happens is we lock all of the final spots on this tree that have a druid on them. Now, at this point, we are just here at the front, but as you can see at the very ends of each of these branches, there is a key icon. As soon as any player reaches a spot with a key icon, they immediately in that moment score points depending on this criteria. For this one, you simply get one point for every five points you have, and this one gives you two points for every elder druid you have. That one gets you two points for each creature card you have. This is two points for every potion that you have brewed. That one is two points for every menher and shrine you have. And lastly, this one gets you three points for every artifact you've completed or are working on next to your board. So obviously, moving down these branches is something you want to keep in mind in order to get points for the things that you have already done. We already have one brewed potion, so I'd love to make it along this branch here. But of course, we haven't even started on the mistletoe branch yet because we used a mistletoe card in order to perform a temple action. Now, as I said, at this moment, if any of these druids were at the end, we would lay them down, and that locks that scoring option for the rest of the game. This means multiple players can do this scoring option as long as they reach that spot within the same round. Then, once you lie them down, that means no player can go past this spot for the rest of the game. Obviously, in this moment, though, no one is near the ends of any of those branches. Next up, all players can take all of their moot cards back into their hand. And then all of the druids over here are going to go back underneath the oak tree, and we have to draw new ingredients until we have a number equal to the player count, plus two. The next thing that happens in a three-player game is we're going to move the neutral druid clockwise to the next temple, and we always place them down onto the stone spot that shows an illustrated figure. So that means they will go from the two-stone spot in the rune temple to the three-stone spot in the mistletoe temple, and up in the feather temple on the next round, this neutral token will be on the one-stone spot. After that, they'll go back over here, and we'll continue to move once in the dusk phase of each round. After this, we now have to move the solar marker. It goes along this track that's next to the victory point track, and it just moves to the next available spot. We'll put it right over there, and whenever the solar marker reaches a spot that shows at this icon, that is the moment that we will immediately have a solar festival, and I'll explain how that works once it happens. After this, we can pass the starting player token clockwise, so the yellow player will be the starting player. And finally, we can move the round tracker forward to show that we are entering the second round of the game. 
Well, we can start the second round off with the first dawn phase of the game. Remember, we skipped the dawn phase in the first round, and the dawn phase is quite simple. Everyone will gain their listed benefits for the dawn phase. Now, every player is going to gain three of each of the resources, so we will go up to six feathers, three mistletoe, as well as six runes. And players can also gain this icon from other spots like creatures. For example, if any of us had this creature, then in this moment we would gain two extra feathers. I do want to point out that this dawn phase income is different from the solstice festival income, and I'll explain how that works later on. Now, I just realized that we should have immediately revealed a new creature back when the last one was taken. That was a little bit ago. Sorry for missing that. This card should definitely have been there already. Now we can perform the Dawn Phase simultaneously, so we can see the Teal player is going to go up to three feathers, they will have five Mistletoe, and they will have seven runes. And the Yellow player now has their maximum of nine feathers, they also have six Mistletoe, and six runes. Alright, that's finished the Dawn Phase, so now it's time for Day, and the Yellow player gets to go first. After considering their options, Yellow has decided to start by visiting the Rune Temple, and they want to activate the Three Stone option. That is going to cost them four runes, so they'll go down to two, and then they'll send an actor druid out to that spot. That's the first druid going onto that spot, so they don't have to suffer a penalty of putting another active druid down as a passive one under the tree. Next up, they can gain the benefit. Now, this lets them gain one advanced moot card, and as you can see, there are three of them available. Each player starts with the same three basic ones, and this will gain them one of these, and they will have it for the rest of the game. So they have to look through these and make a decision. In general, these are either cheaper versions of other things that we've seen already, or more powerful options than the options that we've seen already. Now, after considering all of these, they would like to take this one. So that means they now have two moot cards that allow them to interact with the Feather Temple. This also means they have two moot cards that would let them move up the feather branch on the oak tree. Yellow is done, so we can move clockwise over to the teal player. Now, they've decided for their first action, they are going to visit this spot here. That lets them upgrade any druid into an elder. And they've decided to create an ovate. They can take this bag of ingredients, and they'll put it like that around this druid. They are now an elder, and the benefit of this specific type is whenever this druid brews a potion, they pay one less ingredient because they have ingredients in their pouch. By doing that, it does seem like the teal player is telegraphing that they are planning on brewing a potion, and they do have a couple of ingredients in front of themselves. Well, it's now our turn, and I think what we should do is increase the number of active druids we have in front of us. Specifically, let's do that by playing this card, and we will do it for the single stone option. That is going to cost us three runes, so we will go from six down to three. Then we can send an active druid to the single stone part of the ruin area, and then we can recruit two passive druids and then place them onto resting spots in our area. So we'll put this druid here and then recruit two from under the oak. And we'll place them just like that. All right, that's finished our turn. Well, the yellow player can take their turn again, and they are going to play this card, and they're going to use the middle option. That is the two stone area of the mistletoe temple, and that's going to cost them five mistletoe, which brings them down to one. This will let them build a shrine in front of them, and they do have to place an active druid onto the mistletoe temple. Fortunately for them, there are no other druids on the spot. Again, if there was one or more, they have to take another active druid from their area and then place it as a passive druid underneath the oak tree. So they can create a shrine, and currently they don't have any elder druids in front of them. So they don't feel a burning need to have another elder druid spot to have them rest. So they'll go with this option and then take four points. That's going to bring them from five up to nine. Yellow is done, which means the teal player can go, and they've decided to play this rune moot card. Now, in this case, they want to go to the two stone spot. That will cost them three runes, although they do get a discount from their creature, so they will only spend two runes to do that. And then they're going to send this ovate out, and that will let them do a brewing action. It looks like the rune temple is the place to be. Everyone has gone here so far in this round, but so far we've managed to avoid going onto a spot that has any other druids in it. All right, Teal can now brew a potion, and remember this elder says they pay one less ingredient to do that. So let's focus over here, and the Teal player only has these two ingredients. Now they get a discount, and because of that, they're going to brew this potion over here. Normally they'd need two mushrooms and an acorn, but they can discount one mushroom, so they'll just spend the acorn and the mushroom, and that one lets them turn one of their druids into the ancient elder type. 
So they'll place these antlers onto that druid, and they are now an ancient elder. Now at this point, I think it's now time to talk about the benefits of all of the different elder types, because the benefit of being an ancient elder is this acts as if it was all of the other elders. So this has every single benefit wrapped up into a single elder druid. So let's talk about the rest of these, because this druid now acts as all of them. Now the top one right here is the Arch Druid. You put this on top of it, and then whenever you place that Elder into a Temple spot or onto a Special Action spot, you pay two less resources to do that. The Teal player already has a base discount of one, so they could use that to increase their discount even more. The next type is a Bard. They put this instrument around them just like that, as you can see, and the Bard is going to sing tales of creatures as well as sacred sites. Now what this means is when you gain a Bard, you are going to take this board right here and put it to the left of your main board. By doing that, you increase the number of open spots for Shrines and Menhirs by one, as well as the number of spots for creatures by one. Moving on, we've already talked about the Ovate, which is going to give a discount of 1 when brewing potions. And then after that, we have the Talon Master. The special effect of this one says they could go onto a temple spot that has at least one other druid, and you do not pay the penalty of having to take one of your other active druids and making them passive under the tree. After that, we have the Recluse, which we've already talked about. And finally, we are down here with the Ancient, which applies to all of these. Now, I said that you put this board out when you take a Bard, but actually, when you take the Ancient, you take this board here and put it down there instead. The reason for that is because this acts like the Bard board. As you can see, it adds one more Shrine site and one more Creature site. And it also acts as the Recluse board because it has a specific place for that Ancient Elder to reside. So only this Elder can go onto that resting spot. This means in the future, if the Teal player does create a Bard, then they could place this to the left once again, and increase the number of Shrine spots and Creature spots by one once again. Another way to increase these is of course by moving these over, but that does cost resources, whereas this does not. Now obviously the Teal player has not created a Bard just yet, but as you can see, this Ancient is very powerful. Now I mentioned at the beginning that the only way to create these Ancients is with this specific potion, so if this potion did not come out during setup, then in that play there would be no way to create an Ancient Elder. Well, that was a pretty big turn for the Teal player, and they are now done. Alright, it's time for us to go, and I think let's send our Recluse over here. That way we can pull three ingredients out of the bag. It's possible we could pull two mushrooms and one acorn when in order to create an ancient elder of our own, but I think the odds of pulling those exact ingredients out are pretty unlikely. So let's see what happens. The three that we got are going to be some more bark as well as roots, and we got an acorn. Now, at this point, I do want to mention that there is a free action that says at any point, players can discard any two ingredients back into the bag to gain one resource type of our choice. So that means in a worst case scenario, if we get ingredients that just aren't working out for us for potions, we can turn them into resources that we might need. Well, at this point, we're done with our turn. So that means the yellow player can go, and they want to play this advanced moot card. Now, if we look at the details, we can see the top option costs zero feathers, and that lets them recruit a single passive druid, and they become active onto a resting spot. The second option says they could spend one feather, and then perform one oak tree advancement going up any branch of their choice. The last option says they could spend four feathers in order to turn one of their druids into an elder. So it looks like they've decided to go with the top option so they don't have to spend any feathers at all. They'll place their druid onto the single stone spot in the feather temple and then recruit another druid. So far they're the first one to go into the feather temple at all and then they'll recruit this druid which will go onto one of their resting spots. All right, yellow is done so teal can go. And on their turn they've decided to play this card here. That's going to take them to the Feather Temple. They don't want to do an Oak action. And in particular, they want to go to the third stone spot. Now that normally would cost them six feathers, and currently they only have three. However, when they send their Ancient Elder over, that is going to give them a two discount on the temple, because again, it also acts as an Arch Druid. And then they get one discount from this creature, so that's three off, which means they only have to spend three feathers instead of six. This is going to place them into the three stone spot in the Feather Temple, and now they can take an artifact. So they're going to look over here, and this artifact lets them turn all of one resource into another type, plus they get three more on top of that each time they activate it. 
This one would let them upgrade one of their regular druids into an elder, and this one would let them take three ingredients out of the bag. Now, they've decided they're not actually interested in any of these three, so they're going to spend one rune, which brings them down to four, and then they can place all three of these to the bottom, and then they'll reveal three more. Now, you can only do this once per action, so they have to choose one of these three. And this one right here would let them perform a brewing potion action at a discount of one when they activate it. That one would just give them six runes when they activate it. And this one would actually let them reactivate a moot card they have already played. They don't have to play any other druids out, and they also don't pay any costs associated with that reactivation. After thinking about these options, this is the one they want to take. After that, a new one is going to be revealed. Oh, and that one simply gets you two points every time you activate it. You'll notice this one does not actually cost you points when you keep activating it, compared to the rest of these, which do cost points. So, Teal can place this right over here, and they'll line it up with the four-point spot, so that will immediately get them four points, which will bring them up to 16. And that has finished their turn. This means it's time for us to go, and if we look out at the temples, there are only two spots left that don't already have at least one druid on them. And of course, if we go to any of those other spots, we'll have to send another active druid out to the oak, and they'll become passive. Currently, our moot cards are Feather and Mistletoe, so these two here. So if we don't want to suffer that penalty, our options are the two stone spot over here for Feather, which would let us spend six feathers in order to gain a creature card. And the other one is the single stone spot for Mistletoe, and the effect of that costs three Mistletoe, and then we could look into the ingredient bag and take one ingredient of our choice. Between the two of those, I think I'm much more interested in gaining a creature card. We haven't gained any so far this game, so I think let's play this one. Now that is going to cost us six of our feathers, and then we can send an active druid over to the two stone spot. Fortunately for us, we had exactly six feathers, but remember we could also spend two ingredients to gain one resource of our choice as many times as we want as a free action. All right, let's look up here to the creatures. Now this one over here would get us two feathers as a part of each dawn phase. That one right there says every time we play a Feather Moot card, we could perform a Temple action and then pay one extra Feather to also move up on the Feather branch of the tree. So you essentially do a Temple and an Oak action at the same time. This last one down here says that for the rest of the game, you can treat any Temple space as if it was the single stone space. Now, currently we have no feathers, so gaining some feather income is tempting, but I am also tempted to cycle these out and see three other options. Yeah, I think let's do it. This is going to cost us one mistletoe, and we can only do this once. So that'll bring us down to two. So let's place all three of these to the bottom of the deck, and then we'll have to choose one of the next three that we see. This one right up here says you gain one point every time you activate an artifact that you already have. Uh, that'd be pretty great if we had artifacts, but so far this game we haven't picked any up. This one is quite simple. You just get five points, and there is no ongoing effect. And then lastly, this one's interesting. That says for the rest of the game, every time we would take a new creature card, we would do it at a discount of two resources. I think out of these three options, that's the one I like the most, especially considering we already have another open spot over here for another creature. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have a way to recruit another creature within this given round, but I think that is going to set us up well for the future. Next up, we have to immediately reveal another creature card. This one, oh, says when you're brewing potions, you could spend two resources of your choice to substitute an ingredient that you need for that potion. All right, we're done, so that means the yellow player can go, and it appears they have less active druids than they would like. Uh, they haven't used this action so far in this turn to get six of a resource, which is a powerful action, considering they have this creature, which lets them do it, but they also feel tempted to send this druid out to do something else. In particular, they are interested in activating this. And between these options, they are going to go with the artifact. So this is going to rotate, and it will cost them two points. This lowers them down to seven, but then they can recruit a creature, and they want this one, which will gain them a point every time they activate an artifact. After they take this, a new creature is going to appear. Ooh, this one says when you take a creature, you can look at the top six creature cards and choose one of those instead. Now, in order to place this down, they need an open creature spot, and they don't currently have one. So, as a free action, they're going to slide this over, and for them, they could pay three resources of their choice. Remember, some of the other ones have you needing to spend specific resources, but their benefit leaves them flexible. Now, in this case, they're just going to spend three feathers, considering that is maxed out, so that's going to bring them down to six, and now they have this effect for the rest of the game. 
With the yellow done, that means Teal can go, and they are going to activate their artifact. That is going to cost them one point, which brings them down to 15, and then they can reactivate any moot card that they've already played, and they can use any option on that card without sending any druids out and without spending any resources. So they can replay one of these, and they are tempted to take another creature by activating that spot there, and they are also tempted to take another artifact. Now, at the moment, they have just one active druid left, and just about all of the temple spots are occupied. You can't actually go onto a temple spot on the board if there's somebody there already, if you don't have another active druid to turn into a passive druid and put under the tree, and the teal player will not have that. So they are very tempted by this option right here to get another artifact, which they could then activate on their next turn with this druid here. Another thing they could do is upgrade and get another one of these advanced moot cards. As you can see, there's benefits like this, which is what they're doing right now, letting them reactivate a moot card they already played. There's other things like turning one resource into another and getting flexible oak actions. There's also a bunch of other options on these as well, but they think when they weigh everything together, they're going to reactivate this and take another artifact. After considering these options, they actually want to spend one rune, and that will put these to the bottom, and then they'll see three more. This one lets you do an oak action of your choice going up one branch. This one lets you gain six feathers, and that one lets you build a shrine. Out of these options, they're going to go simple and take this one. After that, we'll see a new one. Ah, and that one lets you gain mistletoe. So they can place this over here and gain four points, and they of course did have to spend that one rune for seeing more artifacts in the display. So Teal's lead is going to increase from 15 all the way up to 19. Well, it's now our turn again, and I think let's brew a potion. In particular, let's spend a root as well as an acorn. And this will let us perform that potion so we can gain up to nine of any of the resources, so we essentially just maximize that track out. I think in this case, we should probably take a mistletoe. That way, on our next turn, we could use this to perform an oak action to have enough to actually move up. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have something good to do with this druid, and we don't actually have a good place for them to rest. So even though we recruited a couple of druids, one of them is going to become passive without getting any benefit. So I think we probably could have done this round better, but it looks like this is the way it's going to turn out for us. Well, our turn is done which means yellow can go, and they are going to play this card and spend three of their feathers in order to go up the feather branch on the oak tree. Yellow hasn't started on that branch yet, so they can send a passive druid up, and that will gain them two points. After that, teal can go, and they could pass, but they've decided to send their reclusive elder druid here. That is going to lose them one point, but they will gain six feathers. One point will bring them down to 18, and once again, it's our turn. Now, I said on our last turn that we probably weren't going to have a good option for this, but I wasn't thinking about the fact that we just gained a bunch of mistletoe. We could use this card right here and go to the single stone spot, which would cost us three mistletoe, because that is currently the only temple spot that does not already have a druid in it. Remember, we could go to one of these other spots as long as we had an extra active druid that we could then put under the oak tree and have it turn passive. Currently, we only have one active druid, though, so this is the only place we could go, and if we did that, we could take one ingredient of our choice. Now, we already have a bunch of ingredients, but grabbing one of our choice could give us a mushroom, for example, to get us closer to getting an ancient elder of our own down, and that is a very powerful action. Yeah, I think I've convinced myself that that's what we want to do. So let's go ahead and play this out. We will spend three mistletoe. Uh, we will send this person out, and we still don't have enough resting spaces for all of these, but at least we're getting a good activation out of them. Now we can gain one ingredient of our choice, and I do think we want a mushroom, considering we need two mushrooms in order to actually create that ancient elder. So we can find a mushroom in the bag. And that has finished our turn. After this, yellow can go, and they are going to pass. So a passive druid can go over here, and they are going to harvest this mushroom. They already have an acorn, so it looks like they're hoping to also work towards getting an ancient elder. After that, the teal player can go, and they are going to play this card for the oak action. That is going to cost them three of their mistletoe. And this is actually the first oak action of the game for the teal player. They're going to head up here to the mistletoe branch. That is going to gain them two points. 
And at this point, I would now like to talk about these tokens over here. Now, whenever any player has a druid cross over one of these, we are going to remove that token, and then the solar marker will move forward once. As you can see, in a 2- and 3-player game, we double stack them here, and in a 4-player game, you simply put them out there, and again, it's when they are crossed that they are removed, and then that moves the token. This is important because when this token moves, that could activate a Solstice Festival. Now, we know this token is going to move as part of the Dusk Phase, so we are going to see a Solstice Festival at that point, and frequently you can also see these happen in the middle of the Day Phase when somebody crosses one of those Solar Movement tokens on the Oak Tree. Well, the teal player is done, so now we can go, and let's go ahead and pass. This means we can take one of these ingredients, and we currently don't have any acorns, and acorns are needed in two out of these four different potions. So let's take an acorn, and after that, the yellow player can go. They are going to pass as well, and then after that, they are also going to take an acorn. Next up, the teal player can go, and they are going to pass. They'll send a passive druid over here, and then they'll take this bark. After that, we get to go, and we can send this druid over here to take these berries, and that is going to end the round, and it looks like we have a pile of ingredients in front of us now. So we can move into the dusk phase, and the first thing that we do is recall our druids. These are all going to go back under the oak tree, and then for us, these will all come back to our board, as well as these, and we can place our reclusive druid there, we can place these like that, and unfortunately we do not have a resting place for this druid. So that means they are not going to be active anymore, they will become passive and go back out underneath the oak tree, and you certainly don't want to have that happen if possible, but unfortunately that is how it worked out for us. Over here the yellow player is just fine, they have exactly the right number of resting spaces for their druids. And then over here, the teal player will put their ancient elder on the specific ancient elder spot. They'll put their reclusive elder on that specific spot, and then they can place the rest of these down. It looks like they actually have an empty resting spot. Next up, if any druids had reached the end of any branches, we would flip them over to show that those options were locked. And now everyone can take all of their moot cards back, including any advanced moot cards that players might now have. After that, we need new ingredients over here in the forest. The next thing we have to do in this three-player game is move the neutral druid. They're going to head over here onto that spot because that is where the druid figure is printed. Next up, let's focus up here, and I want to briefly correct something that happened earlier. The yellow player gained this creature, but they never actually gained the three points that's listed at the top. That means they should technically be up to 12 points, and now let's move on with the dusk phase. Now what we have to do is move this solar marker one step forward, and whenever this marker reaches a location that has that icon on it, we will immediately perform a solstice festival. The way this works is we first look at the victory point track, and every player who has more victory points than the position of the solar marker will gain nothing from the festival, and everyone who has less points will potentially gain things in this festival. When we focus in more, you can see these festival markers are between scoring points. In this case, the marker is between 10 and 11 points, and the yellow player has 12 points, and the teal player has 20. And that means we are the only ones who may benefit from this festival. Now the way these benefits work is we can look to the oak tree as well as potentially some creature cards, and whenever we see this specific icon, we will gain those benefits. Let's focus in more, and as you can see, we have a druid on this spot, and it shows that icon with a feather. That means we are going to gain one feather, and obviously yellow will not gain anything because they have too many points for this solstice festival. We will also gain one rune, and again, neither the yellow or teal players will gain anything in this moment. If we look farther out, you can see that the rewards get better before they get worse again, and then finally you don't get any Solstice Festival benefits for having druids at the ends, but of course by getting to the ends, you gain those conditional benefits and potentially a whole bunch of victory points. So, let's gain a feather and a rune, which means we now have one feather and four runes. And that's finished the Solstice Festival. Obviously that was good for us and not good for any of our opponents, and this is something that we all have to keep in mind as we are gaining victory points. Obviously there are ways to gain and lose points in this game, and trying to position yourself well to make use of these Solstice Festival benefits is something to keep in mind. Now the teal player doesn't mind too much, they have a whole bunch of points way more than this limit, so they are hoping those points will make up for the fact that they did not make those extra resources, whereas the yellow player is just too points away from gaining those extra resources, so they're feeling like maybe they should not have actually gained this creature, because that would have left them just to the other side of the marker, and they would have gained those extra resources. 
At this point, we can now pass the starting player marker over here, which means the teal player is going to be the starting player for the next round. And then we can move the round marker forward once. Now, at this point in the game, I'm actually going to stop playing through the game. As you can see, there are five rounds, and we've seen two out of those five rounds. Now, once we have completed five rounds of the game, we will move into final scoring. And this is quite simple. Every player once can brew this potion once during the end game. So you can cash out on a variety of different ingredients to get a bunch of points. And if players also have any creatures that give end of game points, then now would be the time that would happen. And after that, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. If there happens to be a tie, then the player who has advanced the most times on the oak tree is going to break the tie in their favor. All right, at this point, I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, and that means this tutorial is coming to a close. I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Oak, and please, if at any point in this video you saw a turn where you thought we should do something differently, or if some part of this game really jumps out to you, then please comment about it down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.